What's up guys? Um, I got a little video for you uh, trying to connect the atomic structure, the structure of the atom, to light and the behaviors of light. Alright, so this is the Bohr model of the atom. So we have our nucleus kind of in the center there, and we have these rings, and N equals, so you got N1, N2, and N3. Those guys are the different orbits that we can see electrons in. Um, so this is what this picture is trying to show you. So we, if I have an electron and it takes in some light, so we excite an electron, it's going to jump up to a higher energy level. So we're starting here with our electron. Um, but it can only stay up at that ex excited level for so long. Just like you, you can only put in so much effort, right? This week, a lot of you had your Calc 3 test and your AP Chem test, right? You were going, going, going. You can only handle that for so long. But after a certain amount of time, that electron falls back down to what we call the ground state or where it originally began. Okay, just like you this weekend, I'm guessing a lot of you are going to sleep lots this weekend because you're falling back to your ground state. When that happens, light is released as that electron falls. So that's your light being released. And we can see that light and analyze that light. Spectroscopy is the study of light. So analyzing the light when we, ex when we excite electrons and they fall back down, they give off light. Studying that light is called spectroscopy. Um, we need to know a little bit about electrons um, and light. They can behave as both particles and waves, so we'll kind of look at both of those ideas. But let's talk about wave behavior first. Um, so when we study wave waves, we have kind of two important measurements um, that we're going to look at. And the first is the wavelength. So if you see here's kind of our rolling light wave, the distance from crest to crest is called the wavelength. The top of each peak is the crest, the bottom of the peak is called the trough. So the first two measurements with light behaving like waves that we're going to look at is wavelength. So here's an example of a very short wavelength. You can see the distance from crest to crest is not very much. And then we have longer wavelengths here. We got a bigger dis distance from crest to crest. The other measurement we're going to look at is frequency. And frequency is how many cycles of the wave do we get in a certain amount of time. So from here to here, a certain amount of time goes by. And you can see we have one, two, three, four wavelengths. Um, so that's a high frequency compared to in the same amount of time, this guy with the long wavelength only has two um, cycles. So we say that's a low frequency. All right, so this scale here, and it's kind of tipped sideways. Sometimes you'll see it um, turn the other way. But this is our what's called the electromagnetic radiation spectrum. So we can measure wavelengths, and usually the unit we're going to see is nanometers, nm for nanometers. Um, and so you can see we have really, really short wavelengths here. These are our gamma rays, x-rays. Um, UV or ultraviolet, and then we get into a very, very small window, just this little sliver here, and we've kind of expanded it out. This is the visible light, so this is what we can see with our eyes. Um, and so that ranges from about 400 nanometers to 700 nanometers. That's where we get our colors. Um, and then we, after we leave the visible light, so after we get past 700 nanometers in red, we're in infrared, then microwaves, and really long wavelengths here is radio waves. Okay, so here's kind of the visible spectrum. You can see the different ranges for the colors. Um, there is a nice relationship for us between those two variables we looked at, which is wavelength here. That's our wavelength, um, and we usually, again, measure wavelength in nanometers, but oftentimes we're going to have to convert it to, um, let's do this guy, we're going to have to convert wavelength to meters for this calculation to work. So 1 times 10 to the 9th, or just 10 to the 9th, 9th nanometers is equal to 1 meter. So we'll use that conversion a lot, this unit. Um, and then... Um, the wavelength times the frequency, remember that's how often in a certain amount of time we are um, getting those wavelengths to go past. Um, frequency is measured in hertz or seconds to the negative one. Those are the same thing. Um, so wavelength times frequency gives us the speed of light. And the speed of light in a vacuum, which we're always going to assume a vacuum because air is close enough, is 3 times 10 to the 8th meters per second. So we'll use our wavelengths in meters, and we'll use um, our frequency in seconds to the negative 1. 
All right, most of you have probably seen a picture like this, but let me explain what's happening here. If we send white light, so that's a mix of all the different colors of the rainbow, white light through a glass prism, what's going to happen is we're going to get refraction from the light, so it gets bent, as you can see, through the prism, and it gets bent twice. Once when we first hit the glass here, and then it gets bent on its way out. And if you send white light through this prism, it's actually going to split into the different visible light, the colors of the rainbow. So I remember the colors by Roy G. Biv, and that gives you the order. So long wavelength is going to be your red. Then we go orange, yellow, green, blue, um, indigo, and violet. And violet is our short, shortest wavelength. And these are long for red. Okay. So there's a couple of different um, spectra we can get um, by kind of splitting the light. So if we have a white light source, we send it through the, the prism, we're going to get that continuous spectrum. But what if I heat up a gas, like I heat up sodium gas, for example, and I send it through that prism? You're actually going to get what's called an emission spectra, and there's it's going to be mostly black, but there's going to be distinct lines of certain colors at specific wavelengths and we can actually use these like fingerprints to identify gases. This is how we figure out what stars are made of, right? Stars are just heated gas. We can actually split the light that they're giving off and identify what elements they're made of based off the different bands are that we see and what wavelengths we see from their spectra. We can do the same thing with um, a like cold transmitting light and we split it through the spectra um, or through the prism, excuse me, and the spectra we get is called an absorption spectra. So it's actually the rainbow, but we have these dark bands um, showing us what light is being absorbed. So this is kind of a rough picture, but if I take sodium gas and heat it up and then I use either some sort of glasses or a prism to split that light, you can see there's definitely some distinct bands of color, right, some, some really bright over there, um, that identify the sodium uh, gas. All right, here's a typical light question or calculation question that you're going to see this unit. The yellow light given off by a sodium vapor lamp, so we're talking about what that picture we just looked at, we're talking about um, one of the bands of light, um, is used for public lighting and it has a wavelength of 589 nanometers. So that's our wavelength. What is the frequency of this radiation or this light? So for this problem, I'm given wavelength, which is 589 nanometers, and we're looking for the frequency. This is the symbol for frequency in, the, in our equation. Um, before I do this calculation, I'm going to convert nanometers to meters. So to go from nanometers to meters, I'm going to multiply it by 1 meter over 10 to the 9th nanometers, or you can think of it as just dividing by 10 to the 9th nanometers. So I get a, a wavelength of 5.89 times 10 to the negative 7th meters. Again, that's equal. That's that's the same exact thing as this. We just switched units so it's more convenient for our calculation. So when we multiply by this fraction, nanometers cancels and we're left with meters. All right, so we have our, our meters for our wavelength. We are going to use the equation C equals lambda V. So the speed of light equals the wavelength times the frequency. So I'm plugging in, we know the speed of light is 3.8 times 10 to the 8th meters per second. That is equal to the wavelength in meters, 5.89 times 10 to the negative 7th meters times the frequency. So we're going to get our frequency, you just divide both sides by that wavelength. We get 5.09 times 10 to the 14th seconds to the negative 1. Um, if you want this answer in hertz, 5.09 times 10 to the 14th hertz is also acceptable because 1 second to the negative 1 is equal to 1 hertz. So this is the emission spectra for sodium. So you can see four distinct bands. Obviously, this is a nice cleaned up version. We looked at the one that was actually taken from the, the lamp. It was a little sloppier, but the cleaner cut your prism is, right? Then truthfully, the newer your sodium is, the nicer you see these bands. So the, I see four different bands um, of light that are emitted with the different wavelength, wavelengths labeled. And each band represents a different wavelength of like giving off when those electrons, remember that Bohr model, when they get excited and fall back down. So here's a, a Bohr model, here's our nucleus. Oops, maybe I need my pen. There we go. Um, and you can see, so here's one transition, the electrons falling from energy level four back down to one. It's giving off this light here with the really short wavelength. Another one, it's falling from level two to one. It gives off a long wavelength um, from 
three to one, we get this kind of in-between green wavelength. And last but not least, we're falling from four to two, and we get this kind of um, shorter, like bluish, violetish wavelength. Okay, so notice if I fall really far, I have a very short wavelength. Okay, that's going to be important. If I fall a shorter distance, right, from two to one, I have this long red wavelength. Um, is all of this <clears throat> happening at once with the sodium? No, not all of this is happening at once with one atom. How do we see all four of those colors on the spectrum at the same time? Well, when I heat up sodium gas, I'm not heating up one, one atom, one Bohr model of sodium, right? So it's not like an electron can be in two places at once. But if I have a, a tube filled with sodium gas that has moles and moles, right? We have millions and millions and millions and millions of sodium atoms. So it's possible for one atom for the electron to be doing this. It's possible for another atom for it to be doing this. So that is how we see all four colors on the spectra at the same time. So I told you that there was a relationship, right? We saw that when the electron fell a farther distance from a higher energy way down back to the ground state, we had that shorter wavelength of violet light. Well, we can actually look at the energies now related to those electron transitions. So Planck is a guy who studied light, and he assumed that small quantities of energy um, were like, he called them quantum, could be emitted or absorbed, okay? So he kind of thought of light as like these little packets of energy, and he called them photons. So he has an equation that the energy is equal to some constant, which we call Planck's constant in his honor, 6.63 times 10 to the negative 34 joule seconds, times the frequency. So there's a relationship between the energy and the frequency of light. So let's look at that. So we're going to look at kind of a similar problem to the first one. We have that same yellow light from the sodium lamp at 589 nanometers. We want to know how much energy is absorbed by that yellow light. So we have the wavelength. We also have the frequency because this is the same wavelength we found in the first problem. And when we had the wavelength we solved using C equals lambda V, we solved for that frequency. So I'm going to use that and then we're looking for energy E. So using this equation, energy is equal to Planck's constant times um, the frequency. So we have Planck's constant, we have frequency from the first problem, we just do some math, unit, the uh, seconds unit will cancel, so we're just left with energy in joules. Here's another approach at a similar type problem, what wavelength, so we're looking for wavelength, of radiation has photons with the energy of 2.87 times 10 to the negative 18th joules. So we have energy, we're looking for wavelength on this one, so we're going to have to kind of use two equations to solve. Let's first find frequency, because if I have V, I can find wavelength. So we know energy is equal to Planck's constant times the frequency. I have energy, we always have Planck's constant, so I can solve for the frequency. Um, so I just divide both sides by H, by Planck's constant, and we can get a frequency of this light at 4.33 times 10 to the 15 seconds to the negative 1, or hertz. So here's what we've done so far. We have the frequency. Oops, I need my keep doing that. We have this guy, our frequency, and now we're going to use that first equation. We learn that the speed of light C is equal to the wavelength times the frequency. We always have the speed of light 3.0 times 10 to the eighth meters per second. We have frequency, which is 4.33 times 10 to the 15 seconds to the negative one. So to find wavelength, we're going to divide both sides by that frequency. I get wavelength of 6.93 times 10 to the negative eighth meters. I do want to put that into nanometers because that's usually the scale of the electromagnetic radiation spectrum, so we can maybe see what type of light this is. So in order to do that, I'm going to multiply by the conversion factor. So I'm going to multiply by 1 times 10 to the ninth nanometers divided by 1 meter. So just really multiplying by 1 times 10 to the ninth nanometers so that way my meters cancels and we are left with 69.3 nanometers. So what you're going to see with these problems is that um, we kind of have this, this inverse relationship. So um, something with a high frequency 
um, is going to have a short wavelength, right? That's the indirect relationship. So like violet light has a very, very short wavelength. It has a high frequency, and that's going to be related to higher energy. Something with a long, slow wavelength, like red light or um, infrared light or radio waves, those guys are going to have a um, long wavelength, short frequency, right, not that often, and a low energy associated with them. So the highest energy on the electromagnetic magnetic radiation spectrum is gamma rays, and the lowest energy are those radio waves. 69.3 nanometers, let me check this out, falls in at about um, like x-ray region for us. All right, so when we did our little storybook, we talked about the Bohr model, and we've been talking about the Bohr model um, a lot in this video, but the problem, the main problem with the Bohr model is that um, scientists actually, when we were working on atomic theory, knew about these spectra, these emission spectra, and so they knew like something like probably electrons had to explain them, um, and so the Bohr model was great. It's It worked fantastically for hydrogen. Hydrogen has one electron, um, and if you have a bunch of hydrogens, you heat it up, you're going to see four lines on the hydrogen emission spectrum. So that's a characteristic of hydrogen. And the Bohr model actually worked to explain that. It worked perfectly. But as soon as you move on to helium, lithium, really any of the other 117 elements, um, the Bohr model is no longer good. Um, but at the time, it was the best thing we had. Um, and so a lot of people still, even we are using the Bohr model. It's good enough for what we want, um, but a lot of people focused on kind of hydrogen because the Bohr model was working. So Balmer is this guy. He really studied, oops, keep doing that. Sorry, guys. Um, he really studied the four emission lines of hydrogen. So here's one, two, three, four. Those are known, um, and he came up with a relationship between um, those four lines for hydrogens and the different energy levels N of hydrogens. So Lyman, <clears throat> Lyman's another guy we're going to, and we're going to focus mostly on Balmer. So he's looking, these are just a different way to think about the Bohr model. He's, these shells, these are the rings. He's just looking at the different transitions and the energy that is given off. So connecting this to the not perfect but pretty good Bohr model, um, Bohr said that electrons orbit the nucleus in those circular paths, and he said that those circular paths have a different certain distance from the nucleus or a radius, right? So if I'm really far away, I'm in a farther out ring, I'm going to have a different energy associated with me than a ring close to the nucleus, okay? We usually say that the rings close to the nucleus are the lower energy and the ones farther away are the higher energies. So we can use Balmer's equation. So here's basically when you kind of crunch some numbers. He says he can calculate the energy of a certain or the energy of a certain ring or energy level um, is equal to some constant 2.18 times 10 to the negative 18th joules um, or multiplied by 1 over the quantum number squared. And the quantum number is just like what level are we at? What ring are we at? So let's use Balmer's equation. Calculate the energy of an electron in the fourth energy. So that's N equals 4 for hydrogen. So we're going to use the Balmer equation. So the energy of the fourth energy level is going to be equal to some constant times 1 over that energy level squared. So we're looking for E. E is equal to, there's that constant, um, and we're going to put the negative sign in, negative 2.18 times 10 to the negative 18th joules over, or multiplied by 1 over the energy level 4 squared, because they want the fourth energy level. So we just plug and chug some numbers, and we get the energy is equal to negative 1.36 times 10 to the negative 19th joules. That's the energy associated with that. Why is it negative? Well, that means in order to get the electron there, we're going to have to put in that much energy. Well, Bohr said that if I, if I excite an electron, right, I put in energy, I can get that electron to jump from one state to the other. So I can absorb, yikes, sorry, I keep doing that. Um, I can absorb energy and that will excite the electron up to a higher ring or a higher energy level, or I can emit that electron can fall back down and I can give off that energy. So he said, well, there must be, if I want to calculate the change in energy, I have to take the final energy minus the initial energy. And don't forget that light released is Planck's constant times the wavelength, so that's associated. Um, but we're going to focus more on this piece. 
So if we combine <clears throat> the change in energy equation and the Balmer equation, we're, we can find that the change in energy is equal to that constant we just saw in the Balmer equation, that r to the h, um, negative 2.18 times 10 to the negative 18th joules times now 1 over the initial energy level squared minus 1 over the finer, final energy level squared. Okay, so let's try using this equation. This will be, I think, our last problem. Maybe one more. Um, calculate the wavelength of light that corresponds to the transition of an electron from N4 to N2. So we are releasing energy as we do this, right? When we go from high down to low, there's one, two... When I go from the fourth energy level down to the second, we are going to give off some form of light. So we're just going to plug in. There's our constant. And we're going to take that one. The initial state was um, the quantum number four, so the fourth energy level, one over four squared minus one over the final state, two squared. Do some math, crunch your numbers, I get the change in energy is 4.09 times 10 to the negative 19th joules. And that is released because we are falling from a high energy N4 down to a low energy N2. So I want you to pause the video. This puts everything we just learned together. I want you to find the wavelength of light released when the electron goes from N6 to N2. And then tell me if it's visible, what color it will be. So pause the video. I'll put up the answer once you're done. So here's our answer. So I used that change in energy equation. I found the change in energy. I then plug that into our second equation, E equals Planck's constant times wave or times frequency. Once I had frequency, I used the speed of light equals wavelength times frequency to solve for wavelength. And then I turned that wavelength into nanometers so I could compare it to the electromagnetic radiation spectrum. Got 410 nanometers, which is violet light, which we can see with our eyes. It's visible.